You remember that Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, wrote it in two manuscripts. The creation story, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. And then Moses did something very interesting. He wrote the next 11 sections in toledos. Uh, that's the Hebrew word. For in your English Bible, it's the word account in the New American Standard or history. If you just turn there for a moment, go to the second chapter and look at verse 4. If you have a New American Standard Bible, you're going to find the word Toledoth in the English is going to be described as the account. Do you see that? Genesis 2 4. You know, Genesis' first book. All right. Uh, 2 4. Do you see the word account? If you have a King James New Version, which I notice some people have, it would be the history. Anybody have a King James Bible in here? Huh? It does it say the history? What's it say? What? The generations. Mm -hmm. the, the New King James Version describes it as history. Oh, all three translations are very good. Uh, the, what Moses did is he divided the rest of the book of Moses into specific chapters uh, called Toledos. And each time, and there are 11 of them. And you can identify each section by the, these words, the account. And of course, I've given you all that information in the past. You can go to our website and pick it up. But it makes it of interest to us. So when Toledoth 1 is 2 4 through the 4th chapter 26. All right. So I'm in. Uh, I'm in um, the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Uh, verse 1, I'm in the fourth chapter of Genesis, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve. That is, uh, they're going to procreate uh, and have a baby. They had relations. The, the Hebrew calls it yada. Steinfeld. Steinfeld always said yada, yada. That's the Hebrew word for to know. And it can be used in a whole lot of different ways. <laughs> uh, now the man had relations with his wife, that's sexual. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of flocks. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> Being a parent, we just had a baby and we jumped all the way to their career. That's not, that's not fair. <laughs> I mean, all those restless nights and all those sick babies and all those hospital calls and all that going to elementary school and all that going to soccer and football and basketball. Eating all those concession hot dogs and all that stuff. And I didn't get a blip. We just went from birth to they're out of the house kind of idea. And we all would dreamed of that. But so when I read, I read that, I went like, wait a minute. There probably wasn't enough Bible here to fill it, fill it up. But I just thought that was interesting. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat portion, which means this is, this is shadow Christology blood and worship. And the Lord had regard for Abel for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard because Cain is a food and Abel's is worship. 
well, that's just the way it is. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Next week, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about verse 7. Today, I'm going to talk about the first family's experiences outside the garden. You talk about a big change. Some of us, I was just talking with Bill, going through changes, uh, moving from the garden of paradise over to another garden, and what a traumatic experience that can all be. Having done that myself, uh, I can relate to this part of the story as well. So we're going to talk about that today. It's the title of my lesson comes from this. It's called The First Family's New Life in Christ. Their new life in Christ. Do you realize, do you realize when they were in the Garden of Paradise, they didn't have a born-again experience with Christ, right? They had a relationship, but it wasn't from being a sinner to a savior. But outside the garden, that's what it's all about. It's all about their life in Christ. Their new experiences out in the world now. See, they were in a bubble, weren't they? They were in a spiritual bubble. In the garden, they were in a spiritual bubble. They're no longer under that spiritual bubble. They're in the world now. They're in the world. Well, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, I've introduced you to the Toledoth. So let me have a word of prayer and I'll get into my morning study. If you're a believer, by that I mean you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and raised on the third day. You believe that for your salvation. Not for everybody else's, but for yours as well as everybody else. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Your body's the temple, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He is there not only to control your flesh, but to give you the dynamics of the Christian life. You've got to walk in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's called sanctification. And that's very important for you. So you have the Holy Spirit, but you could be carnal. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. You need to confess it to get back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit where he can be the dominant force. Third member of the Godhead is everything to your life. My, my. So, confess sin if necessary, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins. You do your priesthood, and then we'll have study. Father, we thank you today for the wonderful, propitious work of Christ on the cross that appeased the wrath of God. We'll never experience it again because Christ experienced it for us on our behalf on the cross. I am crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And how does that happen? He lives by the power of the dynamic of the third member of the Godhead. And Father... I pray today as we take a look at the first family's new experience in Christ out in the world rather than inside the bubble. Later, Job will refer to that as the hedge. I pray you would guide our hearts, Father, that we might see how we could relate this to our own personal life today in 2023 in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me recall where we have come, where we are. By the time we get to Genesis 4, in the first Toledoth, they have sinned. They have broken the commandment of don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the day, in the very day. Not only is it in the very day, but it's in the very moment of that day. 
that they violated, they violated, and then we have Romans 5.12, wherefore is by one man Adam, sinner in the world, and death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. Hello, all mankind. We're all of all mankind. And before they leave the garden, they have to be redeemed. It is, they are redeemed by shadow Christology blood. Later, Jesus is going to be referred to as the Lamb of God, this, the, you know, that has the blood that takes care of our sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17 is going to remind us with the Exodus that Jesus is the Passover Lamb. And now we experience it through Jesus at Golgotha, hung on a cross on our behalf. So we have quite a history. Your salvation has quite a history of redemption in it. You should remember that. You're connected to a, line, a long line of the redeemed of God. When we study a passage like this, this is part of your family of the redeemed. And you could learn something from other people in your family. And I hope that will be true for you as it has been for me. They have been given specific before they left the garden, they were given specific curses on their lives associated with rebellion against the plan of God. You can read about that in Genesis 3, 13 through 19, which we have studied. Then they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, the paradise bubble. And now they're out in the world with new experiences in Christ. One of the interesting things as you see them have to make this transition of move, moving from the garden location, from the wonderful things they had there, they're moving into another arena of responsibility with the plan of God in their life. And what's kind of important to me is that in this all this transition, remember this, God is still in control and he's still meeting their needs. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we get into such transitions in our life. We lose a job or we lose our health or we, we lose things in our life that put our life in a tailspin. And sometime we don't realize until we get over on the other side and get settled down that God has been faithful to walk us through uh, a lot of difficult places in our life. And I want you to remember, with this family, it was true. And with your family, it's true. Philippians 4.19, right? My God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of the glory of Christ. He'll do it by grace. He won't do it by works. He won't do it because, oh, you've been such a good prime. I'm going to help you out. Hey, you didn't do it that way. He does it by your faithful walk. And it's an amazing thing that, you know, you know, we read Matthew 4, 4, man cannot live by bread alone, but needs every word that proceeds. Did he say some of the word? No. Yeah, he said every. Every word that you hear from God should stimulate your soul to be able to reach into life, your life, in a specific, wonderful, dramatic way where you can see God's great, powerful hand working on your life. Man cannot live by bread alone. He needs every word that proceeds from the mouth. He needs every word. Every word will sustain you and, and hold you up in times of distress and trials and tribulations. And... You know, sometimes the movement, being moved from one place to another and, and all of that has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the plan of God. And sometimes, in other words, indirectly and directly, sometimes he's moving you under an indirect thing. It has nothing to do with anything. Just, he just wants you in another location. You can't, well, well, and I hear, I hear this all the time. You say, well, what, what, what made you move from here to here? They say, well, uh, we had a job. Or somebody might say, well, I retired and I didn't want to live there. I wanted to live over here. I've always wanted to live. I remember, I remember Hughes. 
uh, lived up in um, Raleigh and, and loved Raleigh while he worked up there. But his great desire was when he retired to move to Florida. Well, if you remember the Hughes that went to our church. And so he did. Went down there, bought a piece of property, built, built a house just like he wanted right there on the, the ocean, just like he wanted and everything. Uh, stayed there about a year and hated it. He didn't take in consideration uh, the climates and the yearly events and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he, he, you know, we used to, when I was a kid, we'd call that a pipe dream. Now I don't know if I dare call it a pipe dream. But I don't know what pipe we're talking about. But, but anyhow, uh, look, the point is whether God is moving you and it's very clear to you why you're going, or he's moving you, it's not clear, it will be when you get there. <laughs> right? It will be when you get there. And listen, it's always a movement of God. I mean, look, he moves you to some place and you go like, oh my God. And you battle to yourself, I've got to stay positive. I've got to stay positive because I know God put me here. I know God put me here. I know God put me here. And, and when you're faithful with that, first thing you know, he moves you again. You go like, oh, thank you, God. Then you have to go through it all again wherever he puts you. Well, welcome to the first family. <laughs> welcome to the first family. This is their life experience. And we can learn, we can learn a, a lot of few tips. We can get a few tips from them, okay? One of them is that God always takes care of your logistical needs. And listen, I could, go, not just your logistical needs, your emotional needs, your relationship needs, your children's needs, your parents' needs. There are a whole lot of needs that are connected. When one need is met, God is after getting them all. I mean, for you, it might be the starting point of God meeting your needs. Might be he moves you and he's taking care of you logistically, which is a wonderful thing. But in the same time, he's, he wants to meet your emotional needs, your relationship needs. He wants to meet a whole lot. He's in meeting your needs area. Can, can you get that? Look, at, when he, he just enters your life in all different kinds of need areas. Sometimes it's relationship needs. And he enters in and he, he connects you with, my God shall supply all of, all of your needs according to the riches of his grace. And when you cl click into that, just know that he's going to do the same thing with all your different needs. Not just that one. He's put you in the need bubble, so to speak. Well, while they were in the garden, this is, you see that on your paper? Put a star by it. Put a star by it. Because this is why you're here today. Put a star by it because this is why you're here. here. That's why you're here in this church today in Moody, Alabama. While still in the garden of paradise, while still in the, par the garden of paradise, God taught them Bible doctrine to face their new life in Christ experiences outside the garden. He's always prepping you for what your needs are going to be tomorrow as well as today. Oh, you need to get this. See, that went right over your head. It'll play catch up with you, but that went right over your head. Studying the Word of God always prepares you for the now. It cleans up the past, prepares you now for the future. The Word of God today will help you clean up some things in your past, will help you prepare where you are today for the things of the future. That's the power of learning the word of God. Th write this down. 
The, I doubt if I put, no, it's already on your paper. Just circle it. C circle 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and learn it. You know, that's that inhale, exhale of the Word of God. You need to really pay attention to that. Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to introduce you to the fourth chapter, point number one, where I'm going to take you over the next few weeks. I have divided Genesis 4 into three parts for study. In the first seven verses, the first family new life experiences and add in changes. Write that to you. I didn't get it. I didn't get it in. In changes. It should say first family's new experiences in changes. Boy, I'll tell you. He's all the time. I call it moving furniture in your life. My wife, I don't, see, my grandmother was the same way as my wife. We had spring house cleaning. We had fall clean, house cleaning. She changed everything. It drove, it drove my grandfather me nuts. But that was okay, because for my grandfather, as well as for me later in life, the house was the nest for the woman. So we, my grandfather went like, it's yours. Just do whatever you want with it. It's okay. Then we'd go to the barn and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were farmers, and we'd go to the barn and talk about it. And you could, I could hear my grandfather. I, I slept upstairs, and I could hear my grandfather stumbling over stuff. You know, I got, oh, gee whiz. You know, but changes. Changes. Changes are good. Changes are good. Changes are good. You have to learn to change with them. Don't get, quote, set in your ways. Don't get set in your ways. It's the worst thing you can do. The Lord will pass you up because you're set in your ways. You don't want to add. So in the first seven verses, I saw that to be of importance. And then looking at the first family in 8 through 15, it's their, the family's experience with the first real tragedy in their life. The first real tragedy in their life. I mean, it sucked the air out of their lungs. Right? What happened? Cain killed Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel. There's nothing to suck the air out of, the, out of a room like that or out of your lungs. So they're going to go through a first tragedy. And then 16 through 26, the first family's experiences of family division and separations. Uh, two groups of, of, of the human race. The human race is going to be divided into two parts, two groups. One are called the Canaanites and one the Sethites. One are going to be the unsaved and the other going to be the saved out of that tragic experience. Uh, so uh, I'm just showing you where we're going in, in the future. Point number two, in, in the procreation, which chapter four is about procreation, the thing about procreation, having a baby, had been taught Adam and Eve in the very first, in chapter 1 of Genesis 26 through 28. See, God is always preparing you, not only for today, but for tomorrow. He taught them all about procreation before they had any kids. Agreed? They don't have kids till chapter 4. He taught this in chapter 1. Listen, if you'll let God, he'll keep you always ahead of the curve. If you will let God, he will bring you to Bible study. He will set you down. He will teach you things that are important to your life that's going to carry you tomorrow as well as today. You need to pay attention to that. And, and one of it was procreation. He taught them all about, pro listen, not only that, but he taught them about marriage and then married them. In chapter 2. 
And now they're, they're having the full weight of the experience of all of this. See, they, they were given it biblically, doctrinally, they were given it over here, but they didn't get it till way over here. That's why you study the Bible. Why are you come and you, listen, don't walk away and say, well, I, I, I didn't get anything from that study today. You know why? You didn't put anything in it. But you should come prepared to get something. The Holy Spirit. You ought to write down John 14, 26. It says when you study the Bible, he teaches and recalls. That's that whole principle of 2 Timothy 3.16. Inhale, exhale. I, I just don't know. Ecclesiastes 3.2. There's a time to give birth and a time to die. In Genesis 4, they now experiencing both of these. They didn't experience it under the bubble, Right? They didn't experience that under the bubble, right? They're experiencing out in the world. They're going to experience both of us. They're going to experience the joy of birth and the tragedy of death. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3.1, there is an appointed time for everything. You know why you don't, you, let me tell you why you don't know that. You've heard this before, right? Because you should get a calendar. I, you can put it on your phone, I don't care. But if, on your calendar, you should write what happened that day in your life with the Lord. You know, you have a calendar. Back in my day, I still run those calendars, by the way, in my life, where you could set up your whole week's appointments. You had a calendar of the days, and then you could set up your whole week's appointment day by day by day by day. I live by that. M most people do that, want to be on time. Want to be on time of their game, on top of their game. But I use that weekly schedule to to document what God was doing in my life, how my life was moving. And I did it because of Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is an appointed time for everything, and I wanted to be sure I wrote it down. Listen, sometimes I couldn't see it on Monday. I saw it on Wednesday. The appointed time I had on Monday... I had an appointed time, but I didn't get the idea of why it was there. It may have took me till Wednesday or Friday to get it. Then I would look back and I'd go like, whoa. Was that ever interesting? There's an appointed time, and you ought to, you ought to pay attention to God. One of the ways you do is track God in your life. Track him and watch him when, he, when, when he's teaching you, when he's training you, and when he's just blessing you out of sight. You ought to do that stuff. Where did I get that idea? Word of God. <laughs> yeah, but that's a big book. Ecclesiastes 3.1. See, when I read that, I went, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. You mean that I have an appointed time every day, appointed times, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, rock. <laughs> you mean I have, I have appointed times? In my life, daily, I went, who knew? So I started charting it. I started tracking God. 
What a wonderful thing that is. Oh, I'd highly recommend it to you. Oh, there is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event that should be event. Every event under the heavens. That's the reason I do what I do. I want to see that stuff. I want to see it. I might miss it if I didn't. Sometimes I can't see it on Monday. I see it on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I write my prayer, my whole prayers down when I'm, when the Spirit says, I want you to pray, and I go like, ah, pray, okay, okay. I write it down, because that's going to come back. May not come back that, that first day, but maybe the next day with a group of the kids or the group of the ladies, he shows up and shows out. You go, whoa, right? It's called missionary activity. Well, I'm just telling you, see, everybody says, well, I know Ecclesiastes 3. Eh, yeah, 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 I know you know it. But have you tracked God in your life? <laughs> when I told my wife Jane this, I said, I want a different calendar. I want one that gives me the big weeks. This was years ago. She said, well, what do you want to do all that for? I went, Ecclesiastes, I read the thing in Ecclesiastes, she went like, what? Oh, yeah, I want to, I said, I want to track God. And she went like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Track God. I said, well, I think that's what, I think that's what that says. She went, all right, I'll get you a calendar. I'll get you a calendar. You know, that's how couples make each other happy, right? She got me this big old calendar. Eve, for example, Eve was taught that there would be pain in childbirth. You know where she was taught that? Before she had a baby. Genesis 3.16. She didn't have a baby till four. One or whatever. She was also taught that she would be the first mother in the lineage of the Messiah. You know Genesis 3.15? Isn't it interesting how the Bible look at can connect the dots in your life? Isn't that important? See, the reason I would like to have you begin to chart, to track God, is to see Him connect dots in your life based on the Word of God you're learning. Then you would become an enthusiast of the Word of God. When I began to track God in my life, it drove me deeper into the Word. I went, whoa, these are all connected to the Word of God. He taught me this, and now there it is. He taught me this, and there it is. He taught me this, and there it is. Whoa. <laughs> and so I just share it with you. I just, share, I just share the joy I find in my life in the Word of God. I just share it with you. You can do with it what you want. You're going to do what you want anyhow. You can, you know, you think I'm an old fogey and stupid. That's all right. Look, just... Track God, track God for a couple, couple months. You'll be amazed. She was also experiencing the pain of loss of her first two children. She lost two children in one episode. Once again, God showed his marvelous grace and power by giving her a third child who would be the messianic seed of Jesus Christ hung on a cross. Isn't God wonderful? You say, well, well, wait a minute. I mean, he, he took two children away from her. I know. When you track God, here's what you're going to discover. That he has a marvelous plan that includes you. God has a marvelous plan that includes you. You say, oh, no, it probably includes you. No, it includes you. No, it probably includes people that are really important in the church. Are you here? Yeah. Well, you're really important to the church. <clears throat> and what he's trying to show you is his magnificent plan that you're involved in. 
You know, when I was young in my faith, I would hear people talk about the plan of God, the plan of God, the plan of God. Then one day, it dawned on me, I need to be active in that plan of God. How do I do that? Then I discovered, you walk in the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit produces wonderful things. Then you walk in the power of faith, and faith produces wonderful things. And then you go like, whoa, that's how this stuff works. It's exactly how it works. It's exactly how it works. Point number three, as a result of Cain's murder of Abel, mankind was divided, mankind was divided into two groups in the antediluvian world. In the antediluvian world. That's not on your paper. But that's the period from the fall of Adam to Noah. One group were the Cainites, the unsaved, and the other were the Sethites, and they were the saved. The Cainites were destroyed by Noah's flood, Genesis 6 through 9. This is the only record of their existence in human history. Think about that. If it wasn't for the Bible, we wouldn't even know this group of people ever existed. You're not going to find it in archives anywhere but in the Bible. The Sethites were delivered, watch this now, show you how God works his plan. Out of Cain comes the Cainite people. They're anti-God, anti-plan. They're not interested in the plan of God. They haven't been. Their leader wasn't. And the Sephites, and the Sephites delivered by the ark. You know the Sephites are? They're Noah and his family. The Sephites. Well, their third child that they had was Seth. You remember? Adam and Eve had Seth in place of the other two sons. The tragedy of the loss of the two, listen, God in his marvelous grace brought a, not only the joy of the third child into their life, but listen, brought the joy of the journey of that child into their life. This was going to be, the Sethites are going to carry the prominent role in the plant, moving the plan of God forward in human history in the antediluvian world. The, the custodians of the word of God in evangelism were the Sethites. It's, we're here today because they were there then. Isn't it interesting that when you get to Noah, you're, you're, when you get, when that ark rests on the mountain and they walk off, we're reduced to one family in the human race. Think about that. The entire human race has been destroyed by their anti-God Beliefs. They sold their soul out to Satan and the demonic world. And they were all destroyed except one family of the Sethites. We're down to one man family, Noah. Can you imagine? How did that work? Who orchestrated that deal? God. Kept him in a bubble. In the most... L listen, listen church. Listen church. The days, of, the days of Noah were the worst of humanity. We're down to one family. Agreed? Listen. Listen what Jesus said. As it was in the days of Noah, days, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, what? 
What's the answer? So shall it be in the days of the Son of God. You know what days those are, people? Da 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 da. We're there. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We're there, buddy. We're there. The corruption of the evil. Not sin. Evil. Do you not know that we're in the midst of of the evil in America today? When people can't define a male from a female? A three-year-old kid could take a cat and show you. We've got parents mutilating their children, mutilating their children. We're back to the failing cult. Yes. We're back to the failing cult that destroyed Israel. We're not going to come out of this clean, people. We're not going to come out of this clean. We're into evil. This is not sin. This is evil. And you as a Christian need to know how to fight the good fight of faith, put on the full armor of God, and not cow down from a good argument. Because what people need today, more than ever in the world, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't spend my time straightening people out. I spend my time preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to clean up people's life any other way than through Jesus Christ and his blood. What will wash away my sin? Hmm. But you know what takes care of evil? The word of God fights it. The old, Look, put, write this down. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. There's how you fight evil. Evil stands up and says to Jesus, you don't need to go to the cross. You're not going to be buried and you're not going to be raised from the dead. And you need to stop talking that way. You know what Jesus told Peter? Get behind me. You know why? Because that's evil. That's evil. It was for this reason I came into the world to die for sinners. You telling me that's not why I came into this world, Peter? You telling me that's not why I came into this world? And what do you think I came into this world? To start a kingdom that you want to be on the right or the left? Go back to your Bible, Peter, and better read because you're out of whack. Do you know how to fight this fight? Listen, if people are in sin, give them the gospel. Talk about confession of sin. If they're into evil, you got to put the word of God straight on them because you're fighting evil and you're fighting the devil face to face. You got to put the full armor of God on and understand what the armor is. And you got to fight. And that's the only way you can fight and win. It's the only way you can fight and win, evil. The word of God has to be powerful. And listen, the word of God in the church today is being watered down so bad it's, it's pathetic. People don't know. Listen, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God in a way you understand it and can apply it. Listen, you're no, you're no more spiritual than the word of God in your soul. Did you know that? I mean, how much scripture can you quote uh, in a spot? If you would let the Holy Spirit, you don't have to memorize the word of God. If you'd studied under the power of the Holy Spirit, he would recall it. The church has got to fight evil. We're into evil. 
And listen, the youth of America today are wide open for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, Willie? Mm -hmm. How many baptisms did you do Wednesday? Seven. Seven. We, 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 are, we are baptizing kids every month. I'll tell you what was interesting to me, Willie, is the age has gone down to uh, what we call middle school. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I'll tell you what's happening. The, the, the high school, college kids are bringing their younger brothers in. That's exactly what's happening. They've become an evangelical. They're reaching down into their family and grabbing their younger brothers and sisters and bringing them in. My, my, my people, we're in the middle of a great revival here. It, it, I, I just can't believe it. You can't see it. You need to come to these baptismal services and see we had 90 people here. At these baptismals, we had 90 people that, down there, downstairs. Um, businesses are, are, are supporting this idea with, with bringing food in for these people. And everything. It's an amazing thing that's going on. It's an amazing thing that's going on in Moody. And listen, we haven't even begun. We haven't even begun. I heard Willie the other day pray a prayer, and, and he, he claimed the whole, the whole county of St. Clair. Yeah, Willie, I'm so happy about that. We want St. Clair County. We're not just happy with Moody. We want it all. We want it all. And listen, you, we'll teach you how to fight the good fight of faith. We'll teach you. Over this week, you come spend, listen, you come spend a year with me, I'm going to teach you. Got to spend a year. You can't come once this time and once next year. I don't count that a year. <laughs> you got to come a year. All right? It's interesting to note that Adam and Eve had other children. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Once they figured out how that thing was working, they just couldn't shut it down. It is interesting to note that Adam and Eve had other children who, who listen, listen to me, now this is important, had other children who volitionally chose to align themselves with either the Canaanites or the Sethites. Isn't that interesting? It is when you realize only one family of Noah came out of it, right? Where'd these other kids go? Mm -hmm. yeah. not, a, not a good thing. So you can read that uh, Genesis, the fifth chapter. Uh, let me close. God produced two people on earth, Adam and Eve, and Satan caused tragedy, death, pain, and grief. Adam and Eve produced the next two people on earth, Cain and Abel, and Adam caused tragedy, death, pain, grief, and separation. Now, who do you think your enemy is? <laughs> you, better, you better pay attention to him because he's paying attention to you. You see the common denominator here? The common denominator of evil was Satan. So what's Satan's point? It is to attack Christ, the Messianic seed and Savior of the world. We call this, in theology, the angelic conflict. This was some of the first family's new life in Christ experiences to move the plan of God forward in human history. I wonder about you. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Listen. Get your head in the Word of God. Begin to study with us. Find a place of service in the body of Christ. We've got plenty of places to serve, and they're more opening up. We need Sunday school teachers, uh, we need advisors and helpers. There's a lot of things to be done. First of all, get the word in you.
and let the word work out of you the things that God has for you connected with us. Uh, we're just on the front side of a sweeping, on the front side of a great sweeping of the Holy Spirit of God in evangelism. And we're going to need more people for service in this. We haven't even branched out the way we expect to. Father, we're so thankful for this day, for the study of the life of Adam and Eve as they began to live their new life experiences in Christ outside the garden, but not outside of God. Different environment, different circumstances, but the same God, the same word of God, the same functional assets that are necessary. Walk by faith, not by sight, business. And here we are today in 2023, Father. We're in the fight of our life. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Never have I seen this brazen evil and so many people absorbed in it. We as the church of Jesus Christ have, become, have got to become mobile with this message and be bold. Bring people through, through Christ and then arm them with the word of God. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.